The ancient Punic Empire of Carthage was once the most influential political body in the Mediterranean Sea, established by the Phoenicians of the city-state of Tyre, a Semitic people from the eastern Mediterranean who established the main city in northern Africa in 814 BCE. In my video of Histories 11 about the Empire of Carthage, I discuss how a 5th century Carthaginian admiral and colonist named Hanno the Navigator sailed along the coasts of West Africa and founded trading posts, recruited people to accompany him to act as interpreters for other tribes he'd meet, and wrote about them in his Periplus. A Periplus is an atlas, or a captain's log to describe conditions out at sea during an expedition. The original Periplus was lost. But a translation in Greek managed to survive, and is readable to us with the translation I'm about to present to you in English by American antiquarian and classic scholar Wilfred H. Schoff. This Periplus is important, not just because it gives us an idea of how far Carthage was willing to sail, but how Hanno creatively described the things he saw as if they were something out of a fantasy, and that sort of thing is what sticks to people's minds. Welcome to History's Readings, and today, we're going to sail with Hanno along the west coast of Africa to see the scary yet spectacular flora, fauna, and lands that he had no idea were sitting just further south on his own continent. The Voyage of Hanno, King of the Carthaginians It pleased the Carthaginians that Hanno should voyage outside the Pillars of Hercules and found cities of the Lipophoenicians, and he set forth with sixty ships of fifty oars, and a multitude of men and women to the number of thirty thousand, and with wheat and other provisions. After passing through the Pillars, we went on and sailed for two days' journey beyond, where we founded the first city, which we called it lay in the midst of a great plain. Sailing thence toward the west, we came to Saloi, a promontory of Libya, bristling with trees. Having set up an altar here to Neptune, we proceeded again going toward the east for half the day until we reached the marsh, lying no great way from the sea, thickly grown with tall reeds. Here were also elephants and other wild beasts feeding in great numbers. Going beyond the marsh a day's journey, we settled cities by the sea, which we called Carcius Murus, Gita, Acra, Melita, and Arambis. Sailing thence, we came to the Lixus, great river flowing from Libya. By it, a wandering people, the Lixita, were pasturing their flocks, with whom we remained some time, becoming friends. Above these folk lived unfriendly Ethiopians, dwelling in a land full of wild beasts and shut off by great mountains, from which they say the Lixus flows, and on the mountains lived men of various shapes, cave dwellers who, so to the Lixita, say, are fleeter of foot than horses. Taking interpreters from them, we sailed twelve days toward the south, along a desert, turning thence toward the east, one day's sail. There, with the recess of a bay, we found a small island having a circuit of fifteen stadia, which we settled and called it CERN. From our journey, we judged it to be the situated opposite, Carthage, for the voyage from Carthage to the Pillars and thence to CERN was the same. Thence sailing by a great river whose name was Tretes, we came to a lake at three islands larger than CERN. Running a day's sail beyond these, we came to the end of the lake, above which rose great mountains, peopled by savage men wearing skins of wild beasts, who threw stones at us and prevented us from landing from our ships. Sailing thence, we came to another river, very great and broad, which was full of crocodiles and hippopotami, and then turned about and went back to Sirte. Thence we sailed toward the south twelve days, following the shore, which was peopled by Ethiopians who fled from us and would not wait, and their speech to the Lixita, who were with us, could not understand. But on the last day, we came to a great wooded mountain. The wood of the trees was fragrant, and of various kinds. Sailing around these mountains for two days, we to an immense opening of the sea, 
from either side of which there was the level ground inland, from which at night we saw fire leaping up every side at intervals, now greater, now less. Having taken in water there, we sailed along the shore for five days until we came to a great bay, which our interpreter said was called the Horn of the West. There was a large island, and within the island a lake of the sea, in which another island. Landing there during the day, we saw nothing but forests, but by night, many burning fires, and we heard the sound of pipes and cymbals, and the noise of drums and a great uproar. Fear possessed us, and the soothsayers commanded us to leave the island. And then quickly sailing forth, we passed by a burning country full of fragrance, from which great torrents of fire flowed down to the sea. But the land could not be come at for the heat. And we sailed along with all speed, being stricken by fear. After a journey of four days, we saw the land at night covered with flames, and in the midst there was only one lofty fire greater than the rest, which seemed to touch the stars. By day, this was seen to be a very high mountain called Chariot of the Gods. Thence sailing along by the fiery torrents, for three days we came to a bay, the Horn of the South. In the recess of this bay there was an island, like the former one, having a lake in which there was another island, full of savage men. There were women too, in even greater number. They had hairy bodies, and the interpreters called them gorilla. When we pursued them, we were unable to take any of the men, for they all escaped by climbing steep places and defended themselves with stones. But we took three of the women, who bit and scratched at their leaders, and would not follow us. So we killed them, and flayed them, and brought their skins to Carthage, for we did not voyage any further, provisions failing us.